name is Max Hirsch. I'm a professor at the University of Hong Kong, and I'm also the director of a research firm called Urban Experts. And I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you this afternoon about what we can do to make sustainable aviation a reality. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to just take a step back and look at the bigger picture of what's been happening in aviation today. So over the last few decades, we've seen the democratization of air travel. Uh, if all of us jumped into a time machine right now and went back to the 1970s, we'd very likely meet a lot of people who had never been on an airplane before, uh, either because they couldn't afford it or because their government didn't let them travel abroad. Today, in developed countries, unless you're very poor, you can afford to fly at least once a year. And until recently, most of the world's air travel was taking place in North America and Europe. Today, the flying public has gone global. The democratization of air travel has brought with it enormous benefits. Uh, on an individual level, it's given billions of people the opportunity to travel outside their home country. It's exposed them to new ideas, new ways of thinking, uh, and it's expanded their personal and professional horizons. On a macro level, air travel has connected up cities and regions that used to be remote, and it's opened up new opportunities for social and economic development in those places. But the downsides of that rapid growth in aviation are becoming increasingly obvious. Globally, air travel accounts for about 2% of all CO2 emissions, and consumers have started to single out airplanes as one of the main causes of climate change. Now, that's leading to a backlash against air travel that's sometimes called flight shaming. What's clear is that we're witnessing a paradigm shift as more and more people and also more and more governments are calling on airports and airlines to clean up their act. Now, of course, there are lots of different ways to cut down on CO2. Uh, personally, I don't own a car, I live in a small apartment, and I try to avoid eating meat. Um, but I do fly for work. I literally couldn't do my job without flying. And I also fly for personal reasons. My parents, my sister, my best friend, they all live in different countries. And if I didn't fly, I wouldn't be able to see them. Now, personally, I don't find this flight-shaming debate to be very productive. Our society fundamentally depends on air travel for things we've come to take for granted, how we work, what we consume, how we spend our free time, and maybe most importantly, how we stay in touch with our loved ones. So instead, what I'd like to do today is change the conversation and look at the concrete steps that we need to take to decarbonize aviation. One option is to make flying more expensive by imposing new taxes. But there are two big problems with that approach. The first is that unless we can figure out a way to make a worldwide tax, making flying more costly in some places will just displace traffic to cheaper jurisdictions. Uh, and the second problem is that if we raise the price of tickets, uh, we'll basically be dialing back the democratization of air travel. So aviation will once again become a luxury for the rich and will effectively be restricting poorer people's freedom of movement. So at a moment when populism is on the rise around the world, I think that would have disastrous political consequences. I don't believe that taxes will work unless we can pinpoint exactly how we're going to spend that money. So moving forward, the key challenge is to find an approach that's not just environmentally sustainable, but also socially and economically sustainable. What are the opportunities to do that, and what are the barriers? Well, we can break those down into three categories. We can build better aircraft, we can build better airports, and we can build better airport areas. Let's start by looking at aircraft. The first thing we can do is increase the fuel efficiency of jets and use more aerodynamic materials like carbon composites. The next step is to transition to what are called sustainable aviation jet fuels, so things like synthetic fuels and biofuels that we heard a little bit about uh, at the beginning of today's event. Um, and these biofuels blend petroleum with things like cooking oil and agricultural waste. Looking to the future, uh, we need to not only change the way we design aircraft, but we also need to change the fuel source that we use to power them. And the headline here is electric aviation. 
Right now, this technology is in an early stage, but there are about 170 companies around the world that are working on either electric or hybrid-powered aircraft. So that was a, a super quick roundup of the opportunities. What are the barriers? Well, the first is that we've got huge sunk investments in the status quo. A brand new jet costs hundreds of millions of dollars. So let's suppose I'm an airline like Finnair, for example, and 15 years ago I bought 10 A320s. Well, I'm probably going to want to keep flying those planes for a few more decades. The second challenge is that right now there aren't enough producers of biofuel, and that's because producing biofuel is expensive. Uh, and right now there's not enough demand. So basically the technology is here, but we haven't reached critical mass. And without that critical mass, uh, it's going to be tough to build a convincing business case. What about electric aviation? Well, the answer is the technology just isn't there yet right now, and that's because engineers are still figuring out very basic challenges uh, having to do with battery life and how to fly across long distances. So for the immediate future, we're more likely to see things coming on the market like uh, aerial taxis that can do a short hop. How can we approach these challenges? One option is to impose penalties on airlines for, imposing, uh, for operating older aircraft, and at the same time, give them incentives to replace those older aircraft with newer ones. Another option is to mandate the use of sustainable jet fuels and to tax them at a lower rate. Uh, that would jumpstart demand for biofuels and synthetic fuels, and it would create the economies of scale that we need to bring down the cost of production and distribution. And lastly, we need to invest in research projects that look at how to make short-range uh, electric flights both technically and commercially viable. Now, when we talk about the environmental impact of aviation, most of the discussion focuses on airplanes, not on airports. But actually, a lot of emissions that are generated by the aviation industry are produced on the ground. And here's a chart of some of those different sources. If we really want to decarbonize aviation, then we need to build not just better aircraft, but also better airports. How can we do that? Well, the very first thing we need to do is bring high-speed rail into the airport. That way, we can shift some short-haul flights to the rail and reduce congestion in the air. Leading hubs like Frankfurt and Shanghai are already doing this. Moving forward, we need to combine aviation and high-speed rail into one integrated system that offers passengers seamless connections between air and rail. So what are the challenges? Well, in many countries, aviation authorities and railway authorities operate kind of like separate kingdoms without coordinated planning. They don't play very well together. And that leads to a lot of missed opportunities. For example, if we take a look at Germany, Germany has one of the most advanced uh, high-speed rail networks in the world, and it's also one of the largest aviation markets in the world. But if we take a look at the top 10 airports in Germany, only three of them have a high-speed rail connection. Moving forward, we need to develop new forms of co-ownership and cross-investment between airports, airlines, and railway companies. We also need to improve cross-border high-speed rail networks, especially right here in the heart of Europe. But none of that is going to happen unless we make air rail integration a priority. The second way that we can decarbonize airports is by redesigning the terminal. If we think about the average airport terminal, these are enormous structures that host tens of thousands of people a day. They have the carbon footprint of a small city, and they produce massive amounts of waste. That includes human waste. So think about the fact that airport bathrooms have one of the highest turnovers of any public facility. It includes food waste um, from all of the people who don't eat their in-flight meals and from all of the food that gets thrown out of lounges. It also includes toxic waste that gets produced when groundwater mixes with jet fuel and de-icing liquid. And lastly, it includes energy waste um, that we make by heating and cooling these enormous structures and also by lighting terminal areas even when they go unused for hours at a time. Smart airports understand that reducing waste increases 
profits. For example, they recycle human waste and they resell it as fertilizer. Smart airports also use passive daylighting systems, natural ventilation, and solar panels to cut down on their energy bills. And some of the really smart ones out there are starting to build their own microgrids. Finally, smart airports understand that working with nature is often cheaper and more effective than coming up with an expensive engineering solution. Uh, in just one example, building wetlands around the airport is a natural and inexpensive way to detoxify runoff water. So what can we do to support these initiatives? Well, first we need to create the right financial incentives and policies that empower airports to decarbonize. But more importantly, we need to support airport redevelopment projects. Now, why should we do that? Well, it turns out that a lot of emissions are created by congestion and by inefficiency. One of the best ways to reduce CO2 is to cut down on taxiing times and to reduce the amount of time that planes spend circling the airport while they're waiting to land. We also need to upgrade older terminals like these. Um, they were designed at a time when energy was cheap and sustainability didn't matter. Many of them use low-quality building materials, and they're poorly insulated, and I think it's time to replace them. Moving forward, we need to build new terminals and also overhaul our existing infrastructure. Now, to many people, those investments might seem counterintuitive. And it's essential that we explain how newer airports, just like newer aircraft, will actually advance the cause of sustainability. The last piece of the sustainability puzzle lies in building better airport areas. What do I mean by that? Well, how people travel to the airport, and this is what transport nerds like myself call ground access, how they tra travel to the airport is one of the biggest sources of pollution in our industry. Every day, thousands of passengers and thousands of employees uh, come to the airport by car, and that generates huge amounts of CO2. If we could convince most of them not to come by car, we would be taking a huge step towards decarbonizing aviation. To do that, smart cities invest in comfortable and convenient connections between the airport and the city. Uh, so for example, in Hong Kong, I usually take the express train to the airport, and that's because it's quicker than driving, it's cheaper than a taxi, it runs every 10 minutes, and it's designed for people who have luggage. Smart airports also look at how they can empower their uh, employees to carpool, and they also offer additional incentives, such as uh, subsidized or discounted public transit passes. Okay, well, all that sounds great in principle, so what's the challenge? Well, it turns out that airports make a lot of money off of parking. <laughs> in fact, it's the second largest source of non-aeronautical revenue after retail. So in our current business model, airports have a huge incentive to encourage their customers to drive to the airport. We need to steer them away from that, but that's only, that's only going to work if we can create new opportunities to generate revenue. So one option that some airports are pursuing is to just charge a flat access fee to all passengers, no matter how they're coming to the airport. Um, but an even better idea is to find more lucrative uses for the land that's currently being used for parking. So just one example uh, from Singapore's Changi Airport, they recently demolished their central car park, which you see here, and they replaced it with something called the Jewel. Uh, the Jewel combines shopping, entertainment, hotels, uh, with a new check-in facility inside an energy-efficient structure. And from the airport's perspective, this was a really smart way to diversify their revenue sources and also reduce their dependence on parking. So, I know this has been a lot of information to digest, so in closing, I'd just like to leave you with three proposals for how we can make sustainable aviation a reality. The first is that we need to have an honest conversation about what it's going to take to decarbonize aviation. So far, the discussion has been largely ideological, and we're not really talking about near-term solutions that are readily available. We need to educate the public about what needs to change in terms of technology, design, and behavior. Second, airports and airlines need to make sustainability a priority. 
Right now, a lot of CEOs think of sustainability as a buzzword, and they delegate it to a CSR department that has no money and no power. The only way that that's going to change is if we can build a new airport business model. Right now, there are very real financial barriers to achieving decarbonization. We need to replace those barriers with incentives to reduce waste, to increase efficiency, and to adopt new technology. We also need to promote future-proof revenue sources like property development to replace unsustainable ones like parking. Finally, we need to invest in long-term innovations. And airports can't do this on their own. Governments and the private sector need to lead the way in areas that are going to require heavy upfront investments and coordination across different sectors. So that includes things like biofuel distribution, electric vehicle research, and integrating aviation with high-speed rail. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'm looking forward to your questions and comments.